a very good morning to everyone. Welcome to the Agrofood Productive Webinar on Transformation in the Malaysian Poultry Industry. We have here Mr. Terry Tan, President of FAM, as our moderator. Brief information on Mr. Terry. He possesses more than 15 years of experience in the poultry industry, specializing in breeding farm management and broiler farm management. He is currently the managing director of KP Asli Senyam Rahat, a leading kampung chicken provider since 2009, and Pangkal Perdana Senyam Rahat, a poultry feed provider. He is also the director of Syarikat Sing Long Hang Breeding Farm Senyam Rahat, that is a pioneer in the breeding of kampung chicken since the 19, uh, 1907. Sorry, 1970. Aside from managing his own poultry related businesses, he contributes his experience in, and skill to various industry organiza organization and association. Currently, he is the president of the Penang and Pro Province Wisely Farmers Association since 2017 and the Federation of Livestock. Farmer Association of Malaysia since 2019. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass the session to Mr. Terry. Please, Mr. Terry. Uh, thank you, uh, Puan Noor Fatima. Very good morning to all of you for being here with us today for our webinar on agro-food productive transformation in the Malaysian poultry industry jointly organized by Agro-Food Productivities Nessus and the Federation of Livestock Farmers Association of Malaysia, FLFAM, and supported by the Malaysia Productivities Corporation, MPC. This will be the first webinar out of a series of 10 webinars that we are going to present to you. The webinar will be presented by respective speakers from the industries, government departments, and academic sectors such as UPM, on every Wednesday and Saturday. The whole series of webinars will cover all the aspects of the industries, including the issues and challenges that we have been facing from the past, today, and in the future. I am your moderator for today, President of FLFAM. My name is Terry Tan. Before we begin, I would like to thank all of you for your participation in our webinar and also our panel of respected speakers, senior advisor and former president of FLFAM, Dato Jeffrey Ng, managing director of Malaysian, Malayan Paramils, our honorable Mr. Tevi Chai, and head of laboratory of the Institute of Agriculture and Food Security at UPM, Professor Safit Sidek. Today's webinar, is organized with a twofold objective. Firstly, is to provide you all with a background of the poultry industry and how it has been evolved from being a backyard industry to the most advanced livestock industry in the country. And secondly, to deliver the factors that enable the poultry industry to provide a valuable and affordable protein source to consumer making poultry meats and eggs a national food security. The poultry industry is, and always have been, a very dynamic industry. With the course of time, as well as the technological changes and advancement, poultry operations have to change and develop to keep up and stay abreast in the current market. Of course, as an industry, that depends partly on the natural resources there might be some challenges and setbacks along the way that may affect poultry productivities or operation. As agro players, with an important part in the supply demand of protein source in the country and beyond, we need to keep ourselves well informed of the developments and transformation of the industry or related industry in the supply chain to ensure that we have the knowledge of feasible solutions to overcome any challenges thereby maximizing productivities and protecting the national food security. What we will be discussing, discussing in our webinar today will allow agro players to explore the background, development and challenges of the poultry industry, 
I believe that at the end of this valuable webinar, you will be able to gain useful insight to enhance the productivities of your poultry operations. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, our handsome Dr. Jeffrey Ng to present his topic on the issue and challenges of the poultry supply chain in Malaysia. Dr. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Terry Tan, uh, President of FLFAM. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I will be more focusing on the uh, poultry supply chain in Malaysia. And I will define the, 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 the supply chain in more detail so that everyone can understand the whole structure of the supply chain rather than talk about the issue and challenges uh, in, in most of my presentation. I'll let the other presenter to talk about the issue and challenges in, in full details. Okay. Okay. Uh, before I go into the supply chain, I think uh, it's important for me to, uh, to, to, to actually uh, introduce what is poultry industry and what is it, does it consist of. Uh, in the whole Malaysia now, there's about uh, 3,000 farms that is operations uh, that produce either boiler chickens or eggs that serve the consumer. And if we were to look at the past 10 years of uh, growth on this farming industry, uh, we see about average of 5% per annual growth uh, average for the years. And the value of the X farm uh, production that we are able to, uh, to put up to the market is more than 10 billion. And that we are only talking about farm level. We are not talking about beyond farm level. When I talk about the supply chain, then I explain to you where this is split. Uh, with that, you know, we are able to uh, produce about 51.5 kilogram of uh, meat to serve the, 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 uh, the, the people of Malaysia and almost 338 eggs per capita, which means by at least average about one X per day per, per, per Malaysian, including of uh, a baby, a newborn to an old, old uh, man. Compared with beef, we are only doing about 6.5 kilo and mutton is about 1.3 kilo. So we, what is that this number tell us? You know, with that number, we know our self-sufficient level is 105 for poultry meat and it's 123 for eggs. The surplus of this uh, poultry meat and eggs, you know, we have been export abroad, especially Singapore. And that bring back a value of 584 million uh, in 20, uh, 2018, uh, which is also a, a, a substantial important in the economic, if you look at the trade deficit and whatnot. Uh, comparably, if you were to look at the uh, beef and mutton, the self-sufficient level is only 23 and mutton is 11. And a lot of the beef and mutton are, are depending on import. So if we were to just look at the supply chain in, in the nutshell and, and just try to simplify the whole thing, you know, it is from the left to the right, it is starting from feed meal to moving to grandparent stock, then all, all, all and uh, parent stock. For later, we only have a parent stock and we don't have grandparent stock. Then you move to the grow up where boiler, we have boiler commercial farm, then go to processing and marketing. That, that is how the whole thing, if you were to simplify it. But if you go in and break each individual segment, then you see uh, on, the, on this graph, on, on this chart, all the input will be from the left in, and your output to local market to the right, whereas export is at the bottom. So important thing is you, you have feed meal that's on the top, where you import corn and soybean all over the world, uh, but we still use some of the local product like uh, CPO uh, and some others uh, uh, micro ingredient that we can source locally for to, to actually uh, maximize or minimize the cost of the feed. Then we also import uh, grandparent stock day old chick to four 
uh, GP farm in Malaysia. And we also import, uh, the GP farm will then produce uh, uh, DO chip for parent stock. But uh, that four GP farm may not be have enough. So we still import some PS uh, or, or, or parent stock DO chips into the, the uh, PS farm. And all this PF farm will then produce DO chip to the grow out farm, which is the boiler farm. Uh, we sell live chicken to Singapore. But at the same time, we sell uh, or, or we market some of the boiler farm to slaughtering plant or to wholesalers. I say wholesaler, not, not wholesalers. I think it should be wholesalers uh, because we sell a lot of the wholesaler. If you just look at this bulk grow up farm on, uh, uh, to the left, that representing about 10 billions of uh, value in, in productions, uh, either to the right or to the bottom. Then the wholesaler will, 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 will actually either sell it to another wholesaler depending on the layer of wholesaler that they will go through, or they will go to their own slaughtering house or, or soil facilities, which we call uh, medium and small scale. And after the process of birth, they will sell it to wholesaler again, or they will go direct to the retail. Uh, the, the integrated wholesaler uh, slaughtering plant will, may also sell to wholesaler, and the wholesaler may uh, sell it direct to, uh, to the retailer or, or, or the outlets. Some of the chicken actually end up in a secondary processing plant, or we call it further process, where they produce nugget, burger, uh, which they will serve the, the FMB outlet or outlets like a restaurant or whatnot. And some of these uh, further process products will then be marketed overseas. If you were to let's look at this chart over here, the chicken that end up uh, direct to the retailer or to, to the end consumer. Uh, without going through the, uh, the cafeteria or restaurant, it doesn't stand a lot of percentage. You know, uh, we did a, a study before in 2014 or 2015. It's, it's less than 40% of the chicken that grow in the farm end up in the table of, uh, or end up in, 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 in whole chicken in, in the household. But, you know, I don't think this is complete enough. Let us look in further into detail on the, the supply chain. So if I were to break this thing into the half, right? The, the left or the middle to the left is actually what we talk about uh, poultry industry. The middle to the right is actually the uh, marketing side or the, the supply chain of the, the downstream. So we have uh, feed mill, we have integrators and we have non-integrated or independent uh, feed mills. So uh, it is very competitive in, in this segment. Then when you go to uh, uh, great, uh, grandparent stock, you have four integrated players that have that uh, uh, grandparent stock operations. When you go to parent stock, we have 81 farm, but they are owning by 10 uh, integrator and 13 non-integrators. So that also pretty much very competitive. When you move to the farm, you also seeing, uh, you have uh, integrated own farm, you have contract farmer, and you also have independent entrepreneurs who actually grow the chicken and sell it to the markets. So if you were to look at middle to the left, they are actually very, very competitive. However, when you move from the middle to the right, then you have uh, integrators who have their own processing plant, wholesaler that have medium side processing plant, or traditional people that actually process the bird. Uh, uh, in, in a rural area uh, where serve the, the small uh, number of consumer. Then some of these uh, product will then go into secondary productions. Uh, then you have independence uh, uh, factory like the Ramri, they buy uh, from the first uh, primary processes to the secondary processes. Then it move to uh, distribution, uh, integrated own distribution or independent wholesaler. But when you move to independent wholesaler, it could be break into a lot of layer. Uh, I will explain why it happened, uh, what, what, why it causes this uh, wholesaler to have multi-layer. And also when you go to retailer, you also have multi-layer. Uh, I, I will talk more into that later on in my presentation. That is the, the so-called the current uh, supply chain issue. Uh, 
because of this complexity on supply chain also, uh, the, 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 the pricing on the middle to the left are very efficient, but then the, the pricing from the middle to the right are not efficient, uh, which we, we need to have be uh, putting more effort to, to see how we can uh, improve on that. Uh, now, let us look at the layer side. Layer side is more simple. Uh, most of the grow up farm own the feed mills. So uh, they import the, the, uh, the parent stock, the old chicks, and there's total about uh, 28 hatchery or uh, PS uh, farm, which will provide the day old chicks to the uh, layer farm. X from the layer farm will directly be export to export markets, either to uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, or other uh, countries. Uh, then some of the egg will go to wholesaler and market it to retail or FMB outlets. Or some of the growth farm directly sell it to the retailer or the FMB outlets. Some eggs actually end up in a processing plant where we call it liquid egg plant. Uh, some eggs also end up in a further uh, processors like uh, uh, bakery, factories, uh, like uh, uh, canning to do kaya and all that. And those canning or bakery will then export the product overseas. That is how simple layer farm uh, supply chain is. And uh, so this is the uh, major uh, player in Malaysia for uh, poultry, either boiler or eggs uh, in Malaysia. And they have all the big names in, in most of us uh, understand. Uh, issue, as I said, because uh, farm operators are many and complex. That's why uh, boiler price are very competitive. So it moves up and down very quick. Uh, reason why it moves up and down very quick because the, the, the production of boiler are very affected by weather, by the quality of feed or DO chicks or NDO chicks and diseases. And the other problem is, you know, if you were to look at the, the structure of the boiler farm for the past 20 years, a lot of them are still stay in open house system. Uh, because of some issue that I will explain later, the, the transformation of boiler farm from open system to enclosed system are slow. And the other problem that we see on this uh, supply chain is the, the, the time from farm to, to folks, sometimes is too short. Uh, we talk about, you know, we go, go to farm, catch a chicken, uh, at the time you serve in the, in, in the restaurant or in the family is, is within hours or with, uh, within a day or could be a few days. So there's no buffer stock that actually absorbs some of the surplus or actually release when the, the supply are not enough. So, you know, that's something that we could look into to actually uh, balance out the, the supply change. Uh, the other things is, uh, you know, uh, the structure of chicken which delivered to the uh, end user, uh, the, 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 the marketing and the delivery structure are very complex. Uh, it actually involves multi-layer, I mean to say a lot of uh, wholesaler and also a lot of retailer. Each one will take their margin. When you have multi-level of uh, wholesaler and retailer, then when you reach to the, the end consumer, the price become not uh, reflective of the actual price of the uh, farm level. Uh, so this is something that uh, I think the government should focus on and see what we can do. Uh, the last thing is what we noticed uh, from us is some of the product or, or dress chicken that is sold in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in retails doesn't meet the spec of keeping a HEP or, or, or uh, GPD. You know what, by then what they say, uh, standard chicken. Uh, standard chicken uh, under keeping a HEP have a certain definition, even, even GPD have a certain definition. But then when you go to the real markets, uh, they, are, they are not meeting the spec. In fact, in fact the, the, the spec are very bad, uh, not hygiene and safe. So hopefully, you know, uh, keeping a HEP or the government will put some effort into it and see how we can standardize that, that uh, uh, products so that everyone buy the same product and same spec uh, and the, the health of the people will be taken care of. 
Malaysia, you know, have this ceiling price uh, control, control ceiling price for the past 20 plus years. And what end result of this control ceiling price, I will talk about in the bottom. Uh, the other thing that I need to uh, uh, collect myself is not profiteering, it's anti-profiteering act. Also, uh, dampen the, 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 the fate of the farmer for continued development. So what these two uh, law actually uh, affect the, the, the poultry industry is, you know, it limited a lot of people from moving into uh, open house to close house. And it allow uh, also encourage the, the retailer to fix the price because when you have a control ceiling price in the festive season, and that is what they say, uh, 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 gazetted right to sell the, the, the chicken at that price, when the, the, the farmer is actually uh, losing money or, or sell at lower price when they try to offer, when they have excess of, of, of chicken in the, ex, uh, in the farm, uh, the price was not transacted in the, the, the uh, retail market, especially in, in a small town or rural area. So these are the issues that we need to find out what is the best solution to encourage or to educate our consumer on, on selecting the right price to to, to, to favor them on their purchase and to, to actually reduce their, uh, their spending uh, on, on food. So, uh, you know, we really need to look at this, how, how these two uh, uh, law actually affect the, the whole supply chain uh, with the government. With that, I would end my uh, presentation and I pass back uh, my presentation to uh, our president, Mr. Terry Tan. Uh, thank you, Dato. Thank you, Dato. Uh, Dato just presented the supply chain of the poultry industries, such as boiler and layers. As we can see, the whole flow of the, the flow chart very clearly that uh, from uh, beginning and towards the end to the consumer. And the main issue are pricing, the pricing fluctuations anti-profiteering act in Malaysia and so on. This issue would, would discourage the existing or potential industry players to do further investment in Malaysia. Uh, if there's any question that you are going to ask, please feel free to post the Q&A section into the Q&A section in order that we can capture it and uh, answer to those questions during the Q&A section. Now, I would like to welcome our second speaker, Mr. Tevi Chai, to present his topic, providing an affordable protein to the nation. Before I pass the floor to Mr. Te, uh, he was appointed to the board as an executive director of company on 19 June 1989 and is presently, presently is managing director of the company. He's joined Malayan Farm Mills Perhat in 1976 as a deputy mill manager and was promoted as a plant manager in 1978. He was appointed as a project manager in 1979 in charge of the company's entire expansion plants. He is also a director of a Siu Tek Siong Tong Tong charitable organization Perhat. He is a major shareholder of the company. Uh, welcome, Mr. Teh. The floor is yours now. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Terry Tan. And uh, I would like, in the first instance, to uh, uh, express my gratitude to the Agrofood Productivity Nexus, the sponsor, and uh, FLFAM for inviting me to speak on this uh, auspicious webinar. So my topic is providing an affordable protein to the nation, the issues and challenges. So may I start with the first slide? Next. Okay, uh, just to give you a rough perspective, we are basically talking about food. Uh, Malaysia achieved independence in uh, 1957, give you an evolution and of the food industry, uh, the first thing that the government did was to ensure that Malaysia produced sufficient food for its people, food security. And at that time, the key factor was to ensure there were sufficient carbohydrates. 
uh, companies who will come up will produce flour and there's rice to ensure that uh, the stable diet, uh, mainly carbohydrate, uh, is met. As the country GDP grew, uh, the shift moves from pro uh, carbohydrate to protein. So uh, that's how the whole poultry industry evolved from the early 60s or even earlier. And uh, incidentally, the protein, uh, chicken meat is the cheapest form of protein. And as can be seen that in Malaysia, the ex-farm poultry price range from 320 to 590 per kg with a mean of 4 ringgit and 75 cents per kg. In contrast, local beef is currently sold at 36 ringgit per kg. I'd like to give a re the reason why our poultry is cheap. One of the key reasons is we are fortunate in Malaysia, the government allow free import of raw materials. So over the years, the key raw material for poultry feed is corn, soya bean, and soya meal. The corn is around 50 to 55% of the uh, uh, feed ration whereas soya meal will account for about 20 to 25. So we are one of the cheapest import, uh, the, our, the corn and uh, soya bean in Malaysia is one of the cheapest in Southeast Asia, even compared to countries like Thailand, because of the fact that the government allows us to import freely. So today in Malaysia, Panamax vessels of 65,000 tons, uh, Birth alongside uh, the ports in Malaysia and Panamax vessels are the world-class vessels where if we can achieve Panamax size, our ocean freight will be among the lowest. As such, our poultry prices or cost of production, as a matter of fact, is cheaper than Thailand and Indonesia. So that is one key reason why our poultry prices is so competitive uh, <clears throat> and uh, the feed accounts for 60 to 75 60 to 70 percent of the cost of production of broilers may i go to the next slide please as you can see the uh, <clears throat> in the this table shows the ASEAN broiler price. Malaysia is in the dotted red line and we are one of the lowest. Be besides Malaysia, the lower one is Thailand. Let me explain why Thailand can be lower than Malaysia. In Thailand, the, they do not sell or very little of live bird in the market, especially with the uh, experience Thailand has faced uh, in uh, avian influenza, which caused Thailand integrators to quickly convert to production of further processed product. Uh, when the chicken is cooked, the bacteria dies. So that was a major transformation which enabled Thailand to become one of the world a major player in the export of further processed product. Uh, apart from Thailand, I would say uh, Malaysia is probably the lowest. And incidentally, you can see from the table, North Vietnam has very high chicken prices. And a country where they do not have very much wet market, and like Thailand, they export more than 50% of the production you can see the, the live bird price is very stable because they are adding value to it. <clears throat> As for the eggs, we are also one of the lower production. And incidentally, uh, in eggs, Malaysia price, uh, uh, well, you can see there's quite a bit of fluctuation because of supply and demand. But uh, the, the bottom end, which is from 
in around 19, 2018, our prices is lower than Thailand. So our broiler price and is very competitive among the ASEAN countries. May I have the next slide, please? What are the factors that drive the success of our poultry industry? The industry started around 1960, mainly from small and medium enterprises where they can see the switch from carbohydrates to protein as the GDP of the country grew. So, and since then, the industry took off. And today, as Dr. Jeffrey mentioned, we are producing the per capita uh, supply side is reaching 55 kg per, per capita. Uh, I also want to add that uh, although the average growth rate it was 5%, but since 2018, 2019, it has tapered off substantially. Uh, the growth rate now is probably one and uh, one to two percent. And with COVID-19, I would say the industry, in terms of per capita consumption, has declined by 15 to 20 percent. Uh, we will discuss more of this. And uh, as Dr. Jeffrey rightly said, uh, we are totally integrated, very efficient, and we cover farm to fork. The success of this industry is testimony to the significant role of the private sector in its development and accomplishment. Uh, few keys, key reasons for the success, the raw material price is cheap, we can compete, with neighboring countries, for instance, in Indonesia, they ban the import of corn. And uh, when the corn is off season, the price of uh, corn in Indonesia can reach 450 US dollar per ton. So this will push the cost of production of broiler up tremendously. And Indonesia, they substitute corn uh, with the uh, wheat and as the country became the as the country grew in the early part and uh, until recently a lot of poultry companies take advantage of the growth and they deploy modern technology management with the profit they make in order to grow the industry to where it is today so uh, I think, with the, of course, the government has been very supportive. And with this, the industry has become successful. But the future, uh, now we are at the crossroad. We will discuss that a little bit more. So in the next uh, <clears throat> slide, please. On top of that, <clears throat> I've, I've mentioned item five about corn and soya bean, soya meal. I also talk about the, uh, the Department of Veterinary Services have played a significant role in ensuring, working closely with the uh, poultry farmers and the integrators has enabled the country to reach where it is today. And uh, last but not least, institutions of higher learning like University of Putra, Malaysia, where they have covered, they are producing uh, graduates in animal science, in uh, veterinary science, in uh, nutrition, feed nutrition, and also uh, uh, <clears throat> food nutrition, which the industry need in order to ensure that uh, we have continue talent pool for the the whole industry to grow. So with that, may I please? Yeah. 
In terms of farm to fork, I would not cover very much, especially since uh, Dr. Jeffrey Ng had mentioned, uh, where we just quickly from the sourcing of raw materials, which I mentioned just now, the, uh, uh, Malaysia imports close to 4 million tons of raw material. And uh, I want to just to express that our raw materials, the, the pricing of our raw material is very competitive. And sometimes when the supply in Malaysia is excessive, our price is cheaper than the from then the origination example in US because the industry is very competitive and supply and demand drive the price. So uh, the in, with that, uh, uh, also on top of that, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the industry continue to improve and they even deploy internet of things and move from uh, open house to closed house with micro climate technology control and sensors. Uh, this will enable the farmers or the industry to optimize production, reduce the mortality, and even enable them to predict the size of the chicken uh, for cut up and deboning or for the wet market. <clears throat> so the next slide, please. The challenges. I would like to mention that evidently arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, such as the MCO on the 18th of March and the CMCO recently, where the demand curtailed by more than 20%, and such disruption is very costly to the industry. And the COVID-19 has resulted in many industries facing excess capacity. A glaring example is the, in the tourism and the hospitality industry. The poultry industry, particularly the broiler and the eggs, also are not spared. Hence, uh, it is timely we are at a crossroad, if I may say. Hence, it is timely for the industry players and the government sectors, particularly <clears throat> uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industry, DVS, Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, MIT, and even the Minister of Economy. And I believe MBC has taken a lot of initiative to, to host this webinar to make, a, make the, uh, the, the entire industry and the government aware of the challenges. Uh, we have done well in the last 40, 50 years, uh, and it cannot be taken for granted that we will continue to do well. Uh, I think it is timely for the industry and the government to uh, have more dialogue to share where is the direction, how to ensure Malaysia will continue to supply protein at affordable prices and as what we have done before. So government policies are critical and ensure that the poultry industry continue to improve this productivity, efficiency and maintain economy of scale. Example, introdu introduction of automation a lot of discussion has uh, been taken place in terms of cutting back on foreign workers, uh, but clear direction between the industry and the government needs to take place in order to allow time to adapt. And also expanding of the marketing focus from local to exporting of, uh, to export market, for example, to Middle East, Singapore, or neighboring countries uh, to the Middle East will be a area of focus because we have the halal gold standard and this will propel other industry forward. These are the few areas I would like to highlight, but uh, it's not the uh, intention 
to have uh, a lot of discussion today, but hopefully in the uh, supplementary section, we can discuss the incentive with the objective to encourage cooperation between the government and the industry sector so that whatever we have achieved over the years will not be, uh, <clears throat> will be sustainable. Next, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Terry Tan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Te. And thank you, Mr. Te, for your valuable insights on the poultry meat, which have evolved into a staple food in item in Malaysia and the main protein source in Malaysian's diet. Besides that, the factors driving the success of the poultry industry and challenges have been well delivered in your presentations. Mr. Te mentioned that raw materials of S soya bean meals and corns are the cheapest and, uh, and very competitive in Southeast Asia. That's why our cost of the production is competitively low due to the raw materials contributing 70% of the production cost, our poultry production cost. And uh, the other points from Mr. Te is we are the top, we are the second or maybe top three countries to produce the cheapest protein source in the uh, for the country. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Te. Now I would like to welcome our final speaker, Professor Safit, to present his topic on the influence of market demand factors on ex farm poultry, poultry prices. Before I giving the floor to the Prof. Safit, uh, he is a professor of uh, agricultural economy at University Putra, Malaysia, UPM, and the head of the agricultural and food policy study laboratory, UPM. He studied accounting for his graduate degree at Cardiff University, U UK. He has a PhD in Agricultural Economics from uh, Michigan State University. Prof, research interests include environmental and natural resources economy, sustainable development and agriculture and food. Uh, he has worked as a consultant to the World Bank, working on agricultural transformation in Malaysia and its implication on food security. Uh, welcome, Professor Safit. The floor is yours now. Since this is the first uh, installment of uh, several series on Malaysian poultry, I think it's quite important for me to, uh, to give some kind of uh, background. And uh, I'm planning to do a presentation on market and demand structure of the poultry industry. Some facts on uh, the consumption of uh, poultry in Malaysia. Uh, there are three uh, important uh, facts here. One, changing consumption pattern. Another one is changing income elasticity. And the third one is slowing consumption growth. I will elaborate on all that. Now, changing consumption pattern. Uh, you can see over the years, uh, starting from the 70s until more or less today, you, uh, poultry consumption has been increasing. And if you compare to uh, the most important staple in Malaysia, rice, the per capita consumption of rice has been declining. This is primarily because of uh, economic growth and income. Um, in economics, yeah, we have this thing called, uh, this theory called the Bennett's Law, where as your income increases, you substitute uh, starch for more complex calories like protein. And you can see that happening in Malaysia. Uh, Mr. Te and even Dr. Jeffrey mentioned earlier that uh, poultry consumption per capita annual consumption in Malaysia is around 50 kilograms. This is among the highest, not only in this region, but also in the world. 
So uh, there is also what we call changing income elasticity. Poultry meat is no longer a luxury. When I was when I was a kid, um, chicken is considered a luxury food, but now poultry is more or less staple. And you can see that clearly in the uh, percentage of expenditure. This is uh, the, the chart that I have on the left, the table, yeah? Shows the uh, percentage of expenditure on food. We don't have a specific line item on poultry, but we have meat. Meat uh, covers poultry and, and meat is mainly composed of poultry. And you can see that the share of expenditure on meat has been declining over the years. See, uh, as your income increases, the amount of uh, expenditure on necessities, yeah, on food, for example, will decline. Now, on average, uh, the average household in Malaysia, this, uh, this is an average, yeah, of course, uh, different income class will have different consumption pattern, but for an average household in Malaysia, they spend around 18 to 20% on food today. And if you look at meat, meat was uh, around 3.6% in 1993. Now, meat is 2.6%. You can see that uh, it's becoming more of a necessity. And uh, income elasticity for broiler, this, uh, this calculation was made in 2010. I'm very sure it becomes more elast inelastic today. Uh, it was around 0.3%, which is inelastic. Consumers would, um, as your income increases, you're not going to spend a whole lot more on, uh, on, on chicken. It's, uh, it's more, the consumption is more or less stable. Now, what is also interesting is since we are already consuming at almost our peak, the, uh, you can see slower growth in uh, future consumption among uh, household consumption. Uh, total consumption will definitely increase because of the uh, uh, increase in population. But if you look at the per capita consumption, it's not going to increase like before anymore. If you look at from 2000 to 2009, the growth uh, in per capita consumption was around 4.2%. Uh, from 2010 to 2017, the growth is, has, has declined to more or less around 1.9%. 1. 1. It is still growing, but it's growing at a declining rate. So this is a clear evidence that the growth in poultry consumption is slowing down. And this is a very important um, aspect that has to be taken into consideration by, by the industry. And uh, because uh, this will tell what the industry needs to do in order to, to keep on uh, growing. You cannot rely on household consumption anymore. Um, looking at price, uh, poultry price, despite a lot of uh, complaints, you always see that price of chicken has gone up and things like that. But if you look at the growth in price compared to lamb, beef, and mutton, Poultry prices have not been growing as much as compared to the other meat substitute. Uh, you can look at the blue line. That is the, 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 the trend in poultry prices uh, from uh, 2000 to 2016. I don't have a more recent, uh, recent data though to compare, but uh, it has gone up a bit, but still uh, a lot less compared to, uh, to, to, to other meat. So I also uh, plotted the, uh, the, the, the price behavior for um, farm wholesale and retail price. Uh, the main reason, I mean, you can see uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an upward trend, just a bit on, on the prices. But what is important is I wanted to show you the cost pass through. You can see this, uh, you can see that clearly the margins between uh, wholesale and, and retail. And I plotted that on the, on the right panel. And you can see that uh, wholesale margin has been going down and, and retail margin is, uh, is quite, you know, it's increasing, but a, at a very uh, marginal uh, increase, I would say. It's more or less quite stable. Uh, 
of course there are fluctuations and and but the overall circular trend is it's not it's not really uh, it doesn't show a huge increase or anything it's fairly stable over the years and if you if you take into account inflation and things like that i think uh, price of poultry has been quite um, quite cheap uh, I spoke about demand. I think this is uh, this is quite important as well. Um, if you, I, uh, I would like to show you the structure of demand on all agriculture-based industry, and you can see that most of, almost all uh, agriculture-based industry, with the exception of rubber, are all domestic-oriented. And uh, and here. Uh, to begin, demand can be divided into domestic and, also, and export demand. And if I were to show you how we decompose this, you can see that uh, overall the demand uh, in poultry has increased from 7.9 billion to 17.5 billion in 2015. In case you're wondering why I'm not using the latest data, because this is, uh, this is using the uh, system of national accounts and the latest information that we have is, is in 2015. Uh, 2020 uh, will not be out yet any anytime soon. Uh, so going back to this, uh, you can see that demand has gone up from 7.9 billion to 17.5. But what is more important is to understand the composition of demand. Uh, if you look at de demand, I mentioned earlier, it can be divided into domestic and export demand. Domestic demand can further be divided into private consumption, which is the red area, uh, domestic intermediate demand, which is the blue area, and investment. See, if you look at domestic demand, domestic demand comprises mainly of private consumption. This is kind of, this is quite common for agricultural produce. We, we buy whole chicken. We, most of uh, most of the products are being sold uh, fresh, and this is why you see that large chunk of the demand is in the form of private consumption. And 11.5 percent in intermediate demand. Intermediate demand is when you take the chicken and you and you and you send it for further processing. And 3.67 is investment. Okay, if you look at the trend, yeah, from uh, 2010 to 2015, you can see that uh, although the uh, total demand has increased, but the share of uh, private consumption has gone down. What does it mean? It means that the household demand is already maturing. Uh, looking at what we're consuming, we're already consuming 50 kilograms, almost, uh, 50, you know, around 50 kilograms of, of chicken per annum, per person. That is already a lot of chicken. Uh, you cannot expect much growth anymore after this. And uh, we can see more being, uh, more going into intermediate demand, which is, uh, which I think is, is, is a healthy trend. And uh, export share, although it has, export has increased, but the share has, uh, the export share has declined because uh, domestic demand is growing at a faster rate compared to export demand. Okay, that's the demand structure. And I will briefly uh, go through the production structure. Production, uh, share of production components consists of uh, domestic intermediate input, imported intermediate input, and, and also value added. We can see that the share of production component, the value added part has increased. And that uh, primarily consists of compensation to employees and also operating surplus, which is the uh, profits to the industry. Um, our analysis showed that large uh, chunk of value added goes to operating surplus, which is kind of common. Because in, a, in an industry like poultry, uh, if you have an industry with huge capital investment, most of the value added will go to, uh, to the industry itself in terms of operating surplus compared to uh, uh, employee wages. But having said that, uh, poultry industry has one of the highest uh, wages. 
Okay, and uh, the, the faster value added growth relative to domestic intermediate uh, input also is a result of rapid uh, investment in the, in the industry itself. So this is quite a dynamic industry uh, because a lot of investment has been made. The technology employed in this, uh, in this industry compared to other agriculture sector is relatively high. I mean, probably one of the best, I would say. And this is an industry that is actually private sector driven, which is, uh, which is really good. Uh, we also look at the linkages effect of poultry industry. We can see that the forward linkage is pretty low, uh, meaning that um, the, the downstream industry doesn't benefit much from, uh, from, from the poultry industry. And this is quite common when the final demand is fresh produce. Okay. And um, backward linkages has also gone down a bit. And, um, but what is important here is uh, low forward linkage uh, right now presents us with an opportunity for creating uh, commercial demand in the future. And this is the way to grow. I mean, this is the way the industry has to grow because you cannot depend on private consumption anymore. The industry has to, to, to go into downstream process further processing and and this is where where the growth of the broiler industry will be now key lesson uh, i would like to wrap up uh, in terms of consumption broiler is a staple food it has evolved into a very staple food and uh, and it is also a necessity and broiler is also the cheapest source of protein it was also explained just now by Mr. Tay. Uh, to me, the most important uh, uh, conclusion that I, that I can make here is our consumption is maturing. And for the industry, this, the industry has to take note of this and for the industry to profit and grow in the future, they have to, they have to go into, uh, into the processing sector. In terms of production, uh, broiler industry is, very efficient and it is efficient because of technology and we have uh, good technology due to rapid investment from the private sector. And also, uh, of course, um, with uh, good support from, from policymakers as well. And um, I guess this is all that I have. Um, I will you know, address more in the Q&A question I mean, session if you have uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Safit. And uh, Professor Safit just uh, presented a challenge changing the consumption pattern, changing the income elasticity and the slow, slowing consumption growth. And of course, there's a, there are some key lessons of the boiler industry that he have well presented. Dato Jeffrey, you want to tackle some of the question? I think I think I think I start the ball rolling first. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's a lot of question people asking about what is the standard uh, dressed chickens uh, that I mentioned just now in my presenting. Uh, under KPN HGP, there is two uh, standard that uh, they define. One is uh, standard chicken and one is super chicken. Standard chicken is actually with head and feet on and liver mm. and gizzard is in. Uh, super chicken is without head and feet, liver and gizzard. But you know, if you were to go to uh, some rural markets or some Selayang market, uh, you see some people selling their standard chicken on Tarik Perut. That means to say all the internal organs are not actually extract out. They still have a lot of things that's left in there. Even the, 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 the intestine was not fully clear. Uh, worst scenario if you go to uh, East Coast, I will not mention the area. They are, not, they are selling the chicken without tarik perut. I mean to say they only they feather the chicken and they call it standard chicken. So uh, those uh, chicken that they sell is, is quite unhygienic. 
and unsafe because uh, the, the, the bacteria grow in the, the uh, chicken, internal chickens are quite fast. Uh, and I think if you need to uh, talk about it, then uh, I think JPB will be a much better person to, to elaborate why these two definition is being brought up and, uh, and uh, how, how to actually ensure that people don't actually uh, misuse the, or, or mis, uh, interpret the, the standard chicken to, uh, to consumer. Uh, that answer for a second. On the third, yeah. uh, when we, we people are asking why uh, we are not import uh, feed, I think if you were to look at the the, the supply chain of the chickens uh, alone, uh, as I said, the, the first half part of the chicken, what Malaysia industry is doing is actually value add whatever they bring in. Uh, I, I either the GP, they will check, or PS, they will check, or the feed ingredient, raw materials. They value add the thing and then uh, produce all the chicken in the, at a very low price. Uh, in fact, we, we also tell a lot of people that they, the live chicken that we produce, sometimes, or even most of the time, are cheaper than Thailand. And that's prompt to another question why Malaysia are not exporting as uh, Thailand uh, exporting number four in the world or number five in the world, top ten in the world, is the the uh, how to say the, the the issue on the downstream uh, uh, supply chain, where the processing plant are not actually designed for export, and and the the, the cost of uh, uh, production over there are not efficient enough. If we can improve on that part, and the government can help us to market our dress chicken or our further processed product overseas. That will help us to continue to grow the business because uh, Mr. Tay was right that we are actually very efficient on the, 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 the first half of the production. It's only that the second half that we have some issue. Question about the uh, effect of uh, COVID-19. If we were to look at the supply chain also, we noted that a lot of chickens uh, after uh, process actually uh, go into uh, restaurant or, 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 or FMB. So if you were to look at during COVID-19, what happened? Uh, a lot of wedding dinner is being canceled. Uh, government doesn't allow that. A lot of restaurant operation hour is being cut short. Even uh, uh, consume, uh, 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 a customer was being reduced to half of whatever that the, the restaurant is being designed for. But by then, that actually affected the downstream of the supply chain. So that actually uh, brought a lot of effect to, the, to our current supply chain and, and actually affect the, the, the upstream or, or, or the, the farm level. So uh, Mr. T is right that at least 20% uh, of our demand dropped because of COVID-19. But how to, how to promote that, that, that access, uh, how to... To, to enable that, that uh, access of chicken to go uh, downstream or to, to reach the consumer is to encourage the, the end consumer to buy it from retails and cook it back home and eat more chickens, right? Dato, you can answer this, that uh, from the Hill Tech Loan, what areas of poultry industry can do to fight the climate change? Uh, when I mentioned about climate changes, uh, I basically say that uh, because of the most of the boiler farm are operating on the open system. Uh, on the open system, I think see, your production's uh, efficiency is very depending on the, the, the climates. Uh, when you have hot and humid weather, chicken tend to grow slower. When you have uh, wet, uh, it actually affect your, your deochick grow because deochick need warm uh, conditions. Whereas when they, are, when they are adult, they need a bit cool, for them to eat more and grow fast. So, you know, uh, whether like today are a bit more cozy and whatnot, chicken tend to grow faster, uh, sometime a day or two. But when you have hot and humid for, for adult chicken, they tend to grow less. It's just like human beings eat less. To, to combat all these weather or uh, climate changes of weather, I think that the most effective way is actually an uh, enclosed uh, farm, farm system, as Mr. T pointed out. Even if you have IoT, uh, that will actually 
uh, make it even uh, better. But uh, you know, uh, farmer are reluctant to to or, or doesn't able to uh, go into enclosed system because of uh, price control and anti profit clearing act. Uh, because you know, uh, when when we we sell at below our cost, we we are at the loss. But when we are able to make a bit, then the government jump into us and say, "Wow, well, why you are selling so high?" So end up when you look at average uh, pricing for the past two years, even uh, 2019 and 12, a lot of the integrator are losing money. Uh, don't say about 2020 uh, with this COVID uh, even worse. So how can the farmer uh, transform the, the farm from open house to closed house? Mr. Thay, you want to say something on, on this? On the closed house? Uh, on the uh, closed house, uh, why? why Farmer are reluctant to change from open house to closed house. Basically, if I may uh, share, farmers, as a professor, or uh, Shafiq mentioned just now, uh, the uh, <clears throat> growth in poultry consumption in Malaysia is slowing, and. Uh, also, the consumption pattern also shows that uh, we are consuming less. The elasticity uh, data mentioned by Professor Shafiq. So unlike many years ago, when the growth is still there, meaning the demand greater than supply, <clears throat> as a result, the uh, life price in Malaysia become more volatile. So the industry basically is facing some uncertainty. It's not that the technology is not there. It's just that uh, how shall we uh, create an environment where in this uh, market environment where we are a crossroad, how can the industry working with the policy makers can chart a direction where there is comfort for the industry and for the poultry growers to source loan from the bank. And the bank wants to see certainty in paying back. So this requires a lot of discussion uh, in order to sp spearhead the, the right strategic direction for the industry as a whole and the uh, financial industry to have uh, to mitigate risk. I repeat, technology is there. It's how can what is the strategic direction? Thank, thank you, Mr. Te, for your clarifications. And uh, I will pick one question for the prof of it. That uh, one of uh, question from the floor on the queue uh, is regarding the market share data. All right. You mentioned that the broiler consumption has reached its maturity state. If there, if that is the case, why we still need to increase productions? Well, if you if you want the industry to grow, then of course you want to increase production. But you are not. You you go into a downstream processing. You go for export. There's a huge potential in export. I think that one is quite clear. Uh, can I add a bit on on climate change? I mean, just, just, just to add up a bit, you're right about uh, using a closed system. Why do we need closed system? It's because of production efficiency. When your production is efficient, you use less resource. Using less resources, meaning that you are, uh, you're being good to the environment, yeah? And uh, furthermore, closed system is also uh, a lot uh, cleaner compared to, uh, uh, to, to an open system, although expensive. Um, another point, I think it's quite crucial is for you to, to, to use all available resources. Uh, PKC, for example, uh, we should start mixing it if the economics is there, is, is, is there if, the, if the cost permits, and we, we should start mixing PKC in, in our feed so that uh, we can also use something that we produce ourselves. We don't, we don't produce our own maize, so using PKC is a, definitely a good, good alternative. And uh, going to that uh, question again, well, 
what, 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 what was it again, <laughs> Mr. Terry? So, yeah, yeah, you just you just answer that the the in, still need increased productions. Uh, of course, uh, we, we can uh, answer the other question is uh, the market share data, especially the private and the intermediate consumption is very interesting. They said. And uh, does the data include the cut chicken as well in your, in your study? Because it's a, it's a, it's a macro uh, data. It's a, this, the, it's a system of national accounts. So poultry includes everything, cuts and, 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 and also uh, all. Uh, that was a specific question on, for me. I saw it just now yep. asking if I, if I may, uh, Mr. Terry, since yep. I'm already... So the question was, what are the contributing factors to the decrease in poultry? Now, poultry cons consumption in total is not decreasing, it's still increasing, but it is increasing at a decreasing rate. It's, it's different from decreasing, yeah? Increasing at a decreasing rate. Um, and can we expect vegetarianism and veganism, vegan, be, <laughs> are growing in Malaysia, in Malaysia and consumers will shift? Okay, uh, now that, See, when we when when income is low, we consume mostly uh, carbs, yeah, and then we move to slightly more complex uh, uh, calories like protein, where we are right now. And if we go further, then we start thinking about nutrition and organic and vegetarian and so on and so forth. Um, in the next ten years, I I, I don't uh, foresee the per capita GDP to to it will increase, but it's not going to be. Uh, Thirty thousand uh, US dollars or forty thousand US dollars, where Malaysians will start, you know, uh, consuming these uh, very selective uh, uh, food. So that's okay. my answer. Thank, thank you, thank you, Prof. And now uh, I will pick one of the uh, interesting question at this moment that uh, we all have been talking about the IR four point zero. And uh, government has been promoting the IR 4.0 in the, all the industry, including the poultry farming as well. So the question is, do you think our industry players already, they, they are ready to go for IR 4.0 and uh, Internet of Things, IoT level? Do go for industrial 4.0. The first thing the uh, uh, farmer has to do is to uh, convert to closed house, all right? Then come the uh, climate control uh, system where they can uh, monitor the temperature and relative humidity and tweak it <clears throat> with the uh, uh, water curtain. We know very well that in the morning, our relative humidity is very high and temperature is low. And temperature and relative humidity, unfortunately, is uh, on the opposite side. And as we get into noontime, when the temperature rises from 25 degrees or 24 degrees in the morning to uh, at 2 p.m., we will get up to 35, 36. The relative humidity comes down to between 60 to 70 percent. And as we go to the in the evening, assuming no rain, huh, at about 5 or 6 p.m., the relative, hum relative humidity will start to increase and temperature come down. So this climate control using water curtain and fan at the right speed will create a, a thermal neutral environment to, in order to optimize the temperature and relative humidity for the bird to feel comfortable. If the bird is comfortable, it will not stress, and the, good, the bird will eat, and then they will grow, put on weight. And uh, quite often, the house will also have uh, this uh, load cell for the feed and the platform layer for the chicken. So the big, and you can get the data, how much feed is consumed in the whole house, and what is the uh, bird weight of the chicken, then you can mo monitor the FCR and you can predict with sufficient data at what age the bird will reach uh, 1.8 kg or 
2.5 kg. So that is basically the principle behind uh, IoT and uh, climate control. It needs a lot of data for the uh, for the algorithm to, to predict accurately. Yeah, I hope I explained the yeah. principle of it. Thank you very much. Uh, Dato, you want to add out something regarding the this IR 4.0 in the poultry industry? I believe that you, you might have something to add on for this then, uh, to give a clear idea and a clear picture of the IR 4.0 in the Malaysia market right now. Well, uh, IR 4.0 or, or IoT, uh, I think you know, uh, whether industry is ready for it or not, I think it's depending on player to play. But also infrastructures are important uh, because when you talk about IoT, you talk about IR 4.0, uh, data connectivity is so uh, if if the telco are not able to reach the in the farm level or normally farm are in the rural area then you know uh, whatever you want to invest also not doable because you cannot connect to the cloud when you connect cannot connect to the cloud then you connect run the the iot thing but uh, I'm, I'm more uh, encourage the farmer to do precision farming where it's still not depending on the crowd. Uh, you can do it locally in the farm. Uh, so if you, if you can do precision farming as Mr. Tacey, then you can actually efficiently monitor your, the growth of the chickens and also look at the, the, the quality of the feed that you are able to uh, change from feed to meat, uh, then uh, lower down your, your cost of productions. So uh, IoT is important, but then Infrastructure is also important to, to uh, make sure that IoT can be implemented in the farm. Thank you, Dato. I just want to add on some of the points of this IoT 4.0. When you talk about this IR 4.0, you basically talk about the big data, like Mr. Te said, that we need the big data to support our analysis. So we need to do the analytic uh, process in order to get a more accurate uh, predictions and what is the grow rate of our chickens, like Mr. Te and Dato Jeffrey just mentioned. What is your comments on the traceability from farm to fork? Was it still lack in the industry? So it's quite broad the questions and maybe Dato or whoever here can uh, try to answer this. Um. Let me just say something. I mean, I don't have the answer for this, but if you're talking about IR 4.0, obviously the kind of uh, your, your, your data, data management ability should be able to help you do this, right? And um, not only that, IR 4.0, if you, if you really have good, good uh, you know, big data analytics, then you, you can definitely uh, trace the cost, the, uh, the production efficiency more accurately, and then it could, uh, you know, reduce uh, market asymmetry. People complain, right? Pricing. Some people are paying higher, lower, and things like that. <laughs> with with good data analytics, you can definitely reduce all those uh, all those uh, asymmetry. Um, but for that, uh, that that question is very specific question. I, of course, the the producers will definitely have a better better answer. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Prof. And uh, maybe I will very more that uh, the question is basically asking about the traceability from farm to fork. How are we going to trace from the? Uh, are we going to trace from the from the chicks and uh, to the boiler farm, and from the boiler farm to the sorting plants and sorting farm to the consumer after after the dressed chicken? Can so, I try to answer that question? Uh, basically, if we talk about traceability of uh, chickens to uh, to table uh, to to fox, uh, if you were to look at what uh, uh, Japan Pekimatan Veterinary are doing, uh, JPV are doing, they they actually uh, register most of the breeder farm, uh, GP farm and whatnot, uh, and also they 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 do uh, uh, how to say the verification and also certifications. Uh, when you go to a processing plant, 
then they have this V logo, uh, uh, VHM logo plant, and they actually also give certification for that. Uh, that is actually to certify that the, the chicken that we eat from that processing plant uh, are safe and, uh, and, and also uh, good, uh, healthy. So uh, even down to further process product, uh, then after the you talk about uh, in the restaurant or in, in the uh, uh, food outlet, then you know Jackin play a, a important role, or, or others authorities play an important role. But then we do not have like a, a blockchain to to link everything out. But I think somehow others, I think Malaysia uh, chicken traceability are, are quite quite okay or quite good. So I, I, I have faith in our, uh, our chicken products. Uh, I just want to add a little bit uh, on uh, Dr. Safit's uh, uh, comment on the dropping of demand. I don't think that is the dropping of demand that is uh, critical, but then it is a switch of uh, uh, choice of food. So uh, in, in the past few years, I went I attend a, a seminar that actually presented by Robobank. Robobank actually segregated uh, the, the choice of food into four categories. So the first category, they're talking about G, uh, uh, GDP in US dollar below 5,000. Consumer at that kind of GDP choose on grain eaters. So they, they eat more grain than anything. Uh, when you move from 5,000 to less than 15,000, then you are occasional eater. Occasional eater eat more protein compared to the first group, which there are uh, a, a, a green eater. That's why, you know, Malaysia GDP is about 10,000 US dollars a year. So Malaysians are still uh, a part of uh, protein eater or, or occasional eaters. Uh, uh, you go to uh, Kanduri, you eat more. You go to uh, event, you eat more and you waste more uh, in this uh, group of uh, consumer. Whereas when you, when you move from the second group to third group, which is like Singaporean now, which is from 15,000 to 50,000 US dollars, uh, then you're more health cautious. You look at the nutrition, nutritionist of your food that you eat. So that is actually uh, good for the industry to look at how can we improve uh, our, our chicken uh, meat to, to more nutrition uh, 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 product and, and encourage continue grow on the, the, the consumption of meat in, 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 uh, in, in chickens. Uh, and you know, uh, how should we advertise our, our chicken meat in terms of uh, nutrition fact? But when you move from the third group to the last group, uh, which is 50,000 US dollar GDP and above, they are more uh, enjoyment. Food to them is enjoyment. They are, they are not looking at uh, to fill their stomach. They're not looking at nutrition anymore. They, they're looking at all beyond that too. That means to say to them is actually value uh, or, or uh, 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 something that they enjoy. So they are more aiming for uh, uh, basically like uh, organic, they are more aiming on uh, uh, free range and whatnot. So, you know, uh, for industry, we need to know actually where the market is uh, segmentized and we should focus on where we are. Uh, if I were to look at the Malaysian industry, you know, uh, without the COVID issue, I think the, 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 the trend of growing are still there. It's just like how can we make our industry more efficient so that we can export the, the, the our products to overseas, so that uh, we can actually um, uh, how to say it, uh, tap into our efficiency and and actually uh, promote our product overseas. Especially you know Malaysia, I we'll talk about uh, Asian. You know Malaysia is Asian, so we, we can do a lot of uh, further processed product than market our chicken product overseas. Thank, thank, thank you, Dato, for further explanation on the how is uh, communities in this world and uh, especially how to relate to the Malaysia community. In the recent, just uh, the budget, the budgets from the from the parliament, mm. uh, it doesn't seem that there is any allocation. So it means that no allocation for the to help the industry. 
uh, there's a question from the floor. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Despite that, I think uh, if I may speak up, one of the purpose of this uh, webinar is to reach out to uh, the policy makers so that they understand uh, what are our challenges uh, so that we can have more dialogue, uh, perhaps uh, through FLFAM, MPC, UPM and some industry players so that we can have a, a brainstorming session in order for the policymakers to know if we don't do it, what is the what are the consequences? And if we do it, uh, what will the benefits bring to the country and to the uh, poultry industry? I think such uh, communication or exchange is critical. Uh, the country has got a lot of challenges, but we need to communicate. That is my view. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Ted. And I believe that uh, we should uh, using this kind of opportunity via this webinar in order to reach our government or policy makers that you mentioned, then we should our all the industry players can have more dialogues and communication with our industry that are uh, what are the challenges and uh, what are the needs from our players or three players that we need. generally i see the food industry uh, still can turn around uh, for instance uh, i just share a bit we are also we are also in the flour milling industry I do not see any adverse impact on the flour business uh, uh, around March and uh, recently the MCO. But for the poultry, I just answered the question. I, and my answer is we are about 15 to 20 percent uh, below the behind the um, as compared to the pre COVID. Some people may say it could be 25 percent depending on the. Uh, which sector they serve. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Teh. And uh, mm -hmm. Tato, if you have see any question you want to discuss here, so, so uh, or all the panelists here, we want to feel free to pick up some of the question to discuss here. So please do so. You know, uh, instead of I uh, can uh, choose uh, which are more important, we can discuss here that are more related to our objectives today. Uh, in terms of the budgets, I think uh, it's not a surprise that uh, uh, poultry was not uh, having any uh, advantage at all. But then uh, that have been the uh, way things have happened for the past uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, basically, when, when the industry is uh, reaching a self-sufficient level of more than 100%, uh, uh, the government will not put a lot of uh, effort into it. But then I do actually... Uh, uh, really uh, ask uh, the government to look into the, uh, how they say, uh, tax advantage or the tax uh, uh, way uh, for, for farm to convert from open house to close house. So uh, maybe some tax incentive on that, that will help uh, and, and promote the uh, better investment, investment of the, 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 the farm operations. I do see some question people asking about chicken price. Uh, and then they ask how low is supposed to be low and how high is supposed to be high. But I think this question is very, very difficult to answer. Uh, when we look at the uh, uh, food security, you know, uh, in the uh, uh, world organization, the definition of food security is, is mean that the, there should be uh, affordable, uh, but not saying that cheap or expensive. The cheap or expensive are quite a relative. But then, you know, uh, cheap or expensive is not actually a yardstick for, for, for food security. Yeah. If uh, I may, Tato, Jeffrey, I think the question, the more correct question is, are we efficient and are we pro productive? If we are efficient, 
then the pricing will be a function of market supply and demand. Yeah. So uh, I would say uh, Professor Shafiq can uh, maybe substantiate. I think my view is the Malaysian poultry industry is sufficient. But the question is, uh, how can we change and become more efficient in the further process to add value so that we can export? I think that is the direction forward. And uh, the industry now is grappling as to how best to do it. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I want to add on, on, on uh, what Mr. Tay say is correct. Uh, you know, the value that you buy on your chicken also related to the uh, safety and the hygiene of the, the chicken that is prepared for them. Uh, you know, uh, if, for example, DVS is asking for more or less use of antibiotic, uh, the cost to grow the bird are, are going to be increased. So sooner or later, the consumer will actually have to absorb that kind of extra cost and cannot demanding that, you know, uh, uh, they want good but then cheap, you know, uh, not, not, nothing in the world that can be good and cheap. So, you know, uh, there is always an association with uh, quality versus price. So we, we want the Malaysian consumer to understand that part also. Right, Dr. Safi? Yeah, Dr. Safi, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, on, on whether how, how expensive, expensive and how cheap is cheap, again, I... Of course, I agree with that, Jeffrey. That is all uh, is all relative. But what is more important is you need to have a competitive and and efficient market. So whatever the price is, the price is going to be fair. I mean that that, that is what we want. Um, if 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 consumers want really cheap prices uh, to a certain extent that it blows all the producers out of the water, then you're not going to have a sustainable industry. Okay, so this is key. Yeah? You have to understand the cost structure. You have to strive for, for lower cost, the lowest cost possible. And, and again, when I say lowest cost, I, I'm not saying that you go for lowest cost, you cut corners and, and, and do not take into account um, you know, implications such as uh, ecological, environmental implications, and so on and so forth. It has to be sustainable. And if you do it right, um, the pricing is certainly uh, going to be fair and also sustainable. Uh, the reason why we have ceiling prices is because we do not want the, the consumers, this is, this is again uh, the kind of pricing structure to, to protect uh, consumers, but we also have to be mindful of, of whether the prices could actually cover the, the producer's cost. I mean, again, there's no really, uh, it's very difficult. To, I mean, how, how can you, you, you have to strive for the, the, the efficient uh, equilibrium price. And you can do that if the industry is efficient. That was a very uh, interesting question for me that I see here. Practical and direct question. If you have 100 million loan, would you invest in farming such as broiler and egg? Okay, I think this is probably related to the thing that we are talking about. I think, now this is an extremely difficult question. If you, you ask me, if I have 100 million, um, I'll probably go buy properties right now. <laughs> Since they're, very, they're going at, you know, at cheap sale. Uh, but farming alone, the, 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 margin is, uh, the margin is very slim. So the answer is no, unless I am fully uh, integrated. Yeah? Unless I am fully integrated, if I'm... I'm farming alone. I don't have that kind of appetite for for hard work and also uh, and also risk. So the answer is no. Thank, thank you, Prof. A very kind of a direct answer to the question as well, based on the. Of course, uh, you have to be integrated. I mean, if you are integrated, then you you are okay. I mean, you 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 <laughs> you can you can uh, you can make money here and there. And this is how it goes. And see, I, I'm not making this up. I mean, you can look at the the, the, the net margins for 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 all the companies. I mean, if I was not mistaken, the highest that I found in uh, from a report in 2017, the highest was QL Resources. That was around uh, maybe I don't know, maybe slightly more than five percent, six percent. The rest are all lower than that. That's pretty yeah. slim. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're right, uh, Professor Safit, based on the data that you can assess. And a question that is quite related to for today's objective is uh, to the most advanced livestock industry in the country. Is the poultry industry ready to implement renewable energy biogas plant? Uh, we are trying on solar. Uh, and we are working on solar now. So uh, we have one farm that is actually uh, operating with uh, solar. So we are still monitoring how good the uh, solar can help to lower our cost. Uh, haven't drawn a conclusive answer yet, but uh, we, we are working on it. Uh, mm -hmm. But we are not 100% uh, in place of the, uh, uh, the energy, the power energy. We are only replacing a certain amount of uh, energy. We have some hiccup here and there, but then we, 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 are, we are going ahead with it. Uh, as for uh, biogas, I think, a lot of people have tried biogas, but then uh, fail. Uh, we need to go into depth uh, to, to study why uh, the biogas fail, uh, because you are dealing with another animal. That's why uh, uh, some question was asking why uh, poultry farmers are not going into different uh, 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 species like uh, 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 duck or whatever. But you know, everything that we are talking about here is is very professional, very, very uh, how to say, very technical. When you deal with different species of animal, uh, they have different uh, problems that associated with it, and also uh, marketing. So you know, uh, poultry industry is very uh, dynamic and very focused on how we operate and how we design our, our operations. Uh, I, I want to jump back to the question that uh, Dr. Safi was was pointing up correctly uh, when. Uh, consumers are complaining about pricing and the government jump into it and say, well, why don't we fix a ceiling price? If the ceiling price is fixed wrongly, you know, it's not helping the consumer, whereas it's actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, damaging the, 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 the whole thing. If, for example, if the ceiling price is fixed too high and the retailer are selling high price and the, the farm are not able to sell at that price, so where is the margin go? The margin doesn't go to the farm. The margin doesn't go to the, the, the farmer. So it go to the middleman. However, when the, the price is fixed too low, then uh, the farmer doesn't have the opportunity to, to gain certain profit or, or doesn't even have the profit to gain. So, you know, uh, the, 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 the middleman also, the, the, or the, 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 for the wholesaler will lose money and the farmer lose money. So you know, it's it's no 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 winner in in the ceiling price. That's why you know we we industry we really uh, asking the the government to look into the, the the ceiling price structures to see how best to if we can can we do without uh, a, a ceiling price set for for the festival and uh, being uh, able to produce a certain transparency on on reporting the the actual. Or, or what is the transpire uh, ex farm price, so that the consumer can buy uh, so called a, a rightful price on the standard chickens. Uh, uh, hopefully, everyone get my message. Thanks. Thank you, Dato. Dato Jeffrey. In your presentation, that you did mention the anti profiteering acts. That uh, what you can evaluate more that what will be the impacts that uh, this act will affect uh, our industries. Well, uh, I think see, the purpose of anti profiteering Act was uh, started worldwide. It's actually to design for uh, uh, a cost plus industry, where it's, you, know, you, you need to have a fixed margin for your operations. And when you market your product, you don't actually take more profit than, than you should. But I, I don't see in the world uh, anti profiteering Act is actually being applied to a primary industry like palm oil, rubble, uh, and et cetera. So anti profit tearing act in Malaysia have been applied on uh, poultry industry. It's something that I, I, I surely don't understand. And I, I really ask the government to, to look into it and, and say, well, what should they do best? Because, you know, we are not a cost plus industry. We, we are a, a, a price taker. You know, we grow the chickens uh, from day one to day 30 or 40. 
when they come to maturity, then we have to sell the chicken. We cannot basically stockpile our chicken in the farm uh, for a few more days because chicken will grow every day and they eat the feed every day. So our cost will increase. And I keep on telling a lot of people when the chicken grows beyond certain size, we have to offer a lower price. You know, we cannot fetch that, that premium price anymore because you have already uh, overreaching the, the premium uh, weight. So, you know, uh, I, I don't know how are we going to be profiteering uh, from, from, from selling a live chicken in the markets. So unless someone can tell me that uh, I can do so, uh, in which I, until today, I don't understand. And the other problem with us is we don't know how to calculate our cost. Because chicken is actually a live animal. Whether they like it or not, they, they want to eat more or less, it's, it's up to them, not us. We are not a machine printing chicken meat or live chicken. If we are doing a machine printing live chicken, then I do have a fixed cost. You know, uh, chicken also will die if they wish. You know, I cannot say that, well, you don't die. You know, you die, I, I lose my money. You can't, right? So how can we calculate our cost of production? And you know where KP and HGP keep on forcing us to calculate our cost of production. We can give some kind of calculated cost, but then it may not be right because it can be challenging all our cost of production because it's not real because it's actually depending on farm, depending on operation, depending on the locality of the farm because everything is variable. Everything is, is variant. So unless Dr. Fah Safik can help me to, to calculate my actual cost of production. But it also will be moved every day, or every hours, right, Dr. Safik? Yeah, we've not been very uh, successful. I know I was supposed to help you guys to, to actually do that <laughs> earlier <laughs> before, before COVID. Yeah, it's a, like, tricky, it's a tricky calculation because there are too many, uh, too many things going, going into it and there are so many variables affecting it. But of course, we can we can we can try to find a middle ground. But again, like you 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 are absolutely right. It's quite volatile, right? Because of, because of uh, you're dealing with with a live product. Oh, thank you, thank you, Dato Jeffrey, to uh, uh, elaborate more on the this antibody ring X and uh, it is supported by the professor Tafit. And uh, I believe that the raw material has been increasing recently that uh, I, it would affect the costing of the production as well. There are concerns current, uh, they, they are about concern about the traceability that we, we have answered that from the farm to fork. So uh, DBS government and uh, the industry players for the private people, uh, the players, we have been working hard to make sure that we deliver hygiene, safety products in the market. So traceability is very important and the digitalization is in going to be imposed soon and uh, everybody is looking at IR 4.0 digitalizations and uh, those things can help the traceability for our products. We, we have a clear picture of the poultry supply chain in Malaysia, which is presented by, the, by Dato Jeffrey. Uh, we know that the cheapest protein source and affordable protein source in Malaysia for today have been. Uh, and uh, thank you very much that uh, every, everybody. And uh, if you want to download the recorded video, presentation slides, and any related to the, this webinar, please go to the MPC Facebook and the website as well. And uh, thank you. I, uh, Puan No, you, you want to say something before we end this section? Yes, thank you, Mr. Terry. Okay, uh, we have come to the end of this session. Thank you everyone for your time. As mentioned, this is the first webinar out of 10 series. We will send the invitation for next web, uh, webinar after this. Just to remind, you may collect your MVC CPD point from today's webinar. Okay, thank you once again and see you soon. Thank you everyone.